предки, которые приходили в эту ночь, в качестве защиты и, возможно, в качестве оправдания. Partially, it was as if the living were asking the dead for protection, inviting them to their homes. Although it is said that the dead would also get power over the living, and if these have been unrighteous towards the departed ancestors, if, just as they did with the gods, they betrayed the force of their forefathers, their names, if they carelessly distributed ancestral gifts and ancestral knowledge, then the progenitors could easily punish them. This we know already from medieval and more tardive ancient legends, when on the night of Samhain the inceptors, the founders of a kin, would come around, pay visit to the offsprings of once very olden and noble families of Europe, and handing out their relentless bills for their slandered virtue, for the squandered ancestral gifts and dignity, given up in exchange for a sniff of tobacco. And this is how things happened. All these would be given away in order to become part of some magic order, like the Jesuit or Maltese orders, and pass on to them all of their family property through oaths that they would give. The oaths did contain such a formulation, that you're giving up all your property, including that of your family, to this newly formed order. But there were also worse cases than that, when the impoverished kins would not only be selling their ancestral gifts, but also their family names. This is what happened in the beginning of the 19th century, when there has been an order for all outlanders to get themselves, for example, German surname. And so later, an order to offer a well-sounding surname, officials would buy these family names from the newcomers, the Jews, Arabs and Gypsies, who in order to have the right to hand out these names in exchange for money, bought them off from most ancient and noblest families. This is how it happened, that many of the outlanders' names so strongly resembled German family names. By the way, not only German, but all others as well. And that is a great stain on the lives of the kings. And on Samhain Eve, ancestors had the right to hold their descendants accountable. This is precisely the reason why Druids and priests of the ancient world, or simply those who have the knowledge, would say, people, don't go out on the night of Samhain if your life and reason are valuable to you. You might come across the wild hunt, which will charge you what you owe, and you won't come home alive. Appease your ancestors, appease your progenitors, so they would stand up for you, feed them, bring them rich offerings to keep them from charging you for the scolded dignity. And most importantly, stay gathered tonight next to a lit fire, don't scatter around. Perhaps people didn't know the real meaning of Samhain, but would implicitly, intuitively, huddle together, avoiding going out more than it was necessary. This led to a belief that one should not sleep on the night of Samhain. But we need to understand one more thing about the wild hunt and the true meaning of its appearance in this world. I hope you still remember that some of those walking the path of magic have been sent by magic itself along the dark path. And although still alive, for the living they are actually not really alive. They parted with them in a certain way, and those whose mind has departed for the dark path, 
They aren't currently present amongst their living, be it with their attention, their life, their feelings, sensations, or physically. But where are they then? Well, it is them who we will meet in Wotan's dark cavalcade. It is them who will with songs and hooting gallop along with the dark forces, because from now on they hold a place in this dark train. Those who weren't burdened to care for the people would be the ones to represent those very ancient spirits who could on this night, just like on Beltane, fly their broom to join the general coven on the bold mountain. It is precisely them who the living would see wearing eerie masks and it was them they would try to appease with offerings that were no longer gifts for the dead, but bearings to ancient spirits. Ancient spirits that one should give anything to if asked, to give without bargaining, complying with any terms and conditions. This very night, and the way Ferrer's sudden encounter with the wild hunt cavalcade on Samhain, the encounter with this dark train gave birth to these very legends, when this cavalcade would request impossible things from the unlucky stranger. As for example, to give away something in his home that he doesn't know he has. Famous story, when a man's wife gives birth to a child, but he doesn't know it yet. So he promises to give away something that he has, but doesn't know that he has. And when he comes home, the wife joyfully announces that you have a son. And that's when the man realizes what currency he actually has to pay with, pay to the dead procession, the wild train of the ancient kings. These are all stories and legends, but behind every story there is an actual event. An unprecedented event, an incredible event, but still an event that actually happened. On this night, the dead hold the living accountable. And the living also have the right to ask the dead for what's theirs in return. The boundary between the worlds is very thin on this night to light a fire in the hearth. And in this very hearth, watching the movement of the smoke and the flame, and listening to the whisper of other worlds. Put out some bread and wine for the departed. On this night, two tables would be made ready, one for the living, one for the dead and the living were not allowed to eat from the table prepared for the dead. It was absolutely prohibited to eat the food that was meant for the departed. An exception would be certain masked individuals, a phenomenon that appeared later in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, when on this night poor people would disguise themselves and ask for gifts from this very festivity. And they were allowed to be given food, meant for the dead, as it was considered that they are sort of living in two worlds, neither with the living nor with the deceased. But are dead for society, poor, marginal folk were considered dead for people who were successful in a social sense, yet still dwelling in the world of the living. For this reason they were considered to be the conduits of the spirits, conduits of other world. And one had to give them food from the table of the dead and receive a sign in return, a certain word. 
something that wasn't considered to be their word. They did not think of it themselves, as they were nothing but messengers. They were just carriers of the will of the dead. Or perhaps of those very dark mages that had to pass on to those who remained here in the light to share a certain word that was of great importance, which couldn't wait to be heard at its usual time on Imbolc. Paying due attention to such signs was common. And thus never to refuse someone who is asking for this very reason. He might give you a prophecy, a prediction or an advice. An advice that could save a life, an advice that might help avoid ancestor's curse or one that might help you to save your fortune. It was also considered later that on this night one should share his goods with those who ask in order for your fortune to grow bigger. But these are really later connotations from the 19th, 20th century, when gold and dollar completely obliterated the human concept of impeccability. If you're rich, you're impeccable, is considered in our days, but we know it isn't like that. So be attentive to the guests and don't refuse those who ask. Merriness is allowed only if it was you who carries the function of the mask. If you are the wild hunt's prototype, the prototype for these foretellers walking by people's homes telling them prophecies in exchange for sweets, apples and other nice teas. Whereas those who on this night stood by the people would only be listening to otherworldly whispers coming from the fire and from other realms. And you had to keep quiet in order to hear this whisper.